Good morning, good morning. Welcome to You Flourish Church. Uh, my name is Kurt. I serve as one of the pastors at You Flourish Church. Excited that you guys came out to uh, join us for worship uh, on this morning. Uh, it's surely an a, a honor and a privilege uh, to be among you. Uh, as I was putting the uh, sermon together, I thought back uh, this week, uh, back to my first role in leadership. And unfortunately, it was as the leader of a, a middle school uh, gang at the age of 13 years old. And we, were, we, we, I mean, we thought we were pretty tough business. I mean, when it came to middle school students, I mean, uh, didn't too many people mess with us. And if you mess with one of my guys, you know, I was, chances are I was going to take you out. Uh, uh, and, and, and so we, again, we, we thought we were, we thought we were big business uh, when it came to, to middle school. And, uh, you know, we kind of ran Edison Middle School and, and, and that was all good. And, and all of a sudden, somehow, some way, we end up getting into it with a high school gang. I didn't actually sign up for that. <laughs> uh, and that was back in the day where it seemed like somebody that was two or three years older than you. It seemed like they were like 10 years older than you. It seemed like it was grown men. And I, and, I, and I remember we were going home and, uh, from, from Edison Middle School, and, and one of the guys that was part of our gang, uh, you know, he, he, he ended up getting into it with one of the high school gang members, and they started following us. And I tell you, I was very, very fearful, but I wouldn't tell the guys that I was leading just how fearful I was. And, and it was only three of them, and it was probably about 15 of us. And... and they're walking behind us, and next thing you know, they pull out some sticks and some bricks, and they start jumping one of my guys. And I froze. And as did the rest of the 15 guys that were among us. And we sat there, and we watched our friend get beat up by a bunch of high schoolers, a few high schoolers anyway, and the best thing that I could do was like scream out to Michael, and I said, Michael, run! Run, Michael! <laughs> and, and he ran, he got up, and he ran, and he ran, and, uh, and I remember running to go tell his dad that Michael had got jumped, and I'll never forget his dad saying, like, and you didn't help him? Uh, so, so, so here I was, long story short, here I was, the leader of this gang, and I did not protect, nor did I even try, because I was fearful. And up to this day, one of my biggest regrets, even today in life, is because I whiffed on my obligation to embody what it meant to be a leader. In contrast, I pray I never have any regrets because I whiffed on my obligation to embody what it means to be a follower of Christ. In today's passage, Paul, he speaks to this very idea as it relates to the obligation of a believer. And as we dive back into Romans 13, Paul, he introdu introduces three more elements of the believer's obligation. And they are uh, a Christian obligation to embody what it means to love a neighbor. A Christian obligation to eradicate works of darkness and a Christian obligation to emphasize the putting on of Jesus. We're going to unpack that first point this morning. A Christian obligation to embody what it means to love a neighbor. Uh, but before we go there, may we go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, God, you are good. We love you. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for your love, for your kindness. God, we pray above all that you would speak. And God, uh, we pray that you will anoint our ears to hear everything that it is that you would speak. And God, we pray that you will anoint our hearts to apply all that it is that you would speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, again, we're picking back up in, in Romans 13. We will begin in the eighth verse, and it reads, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you should not steal, you should not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. If, if you're following along, I want to bring to your attention in, in verse 9 and highlight, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
May the Lord add a, a blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. So what we find here, Paul, he, he, he brings the conversation back to what he had been talking about all along. When he, when he said, let love be genuine. And, 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 and so while the first part of chapter 13, Paul spoke to the ways in which we interacted with the governing authorities. He did not divorce it from love and action that he spoke to in chapter 12. Now here we see back in chapter 13, beginning in verse 8, he shifts back to this concept of love. In verse 8, he follows up his instruction to pay uh, to all what is owed. Uh, look, look at what he said. He says, owe no one, in verse 8, owe no one anything except to love each other. And, and this is interesting because, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Americans, I mean, we're, we're prone to rack up debt. <laughs> you know, we're always shown uh, what's the next greatest thing to purchase. You know, we go from... From, from having big TVs to, to having the thin TVs, going from having big cell phones to having little cell phones. Uh, and and so, so, again, we, uh, uh, America has this, 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 this concept of just feeding this idea of continuing to rack up more and more debt because we want more and more and more and more. But all of a sudden, what we see right here, Paul is saying, he says, owe no one anything except but to love them. And this is an interesting thing because one of the things that we like to tell ourselves about debt is like we want to get out of debt. Oh, I can't wait till I pay off my student loans. Can't wait till I pay off my credit cards. Like we look forward to the day that our debt is over. And, 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 and so what, but what Paul is saying is something that's very, very interesting here because he says to owe nobody anything but to love them. And so what, essentially what he's saying, this is a debt that can absolutely never be repaid. Like you always owe it. Uh, 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 you know, we, we look to the day that we pay off our house. We look to the day that we pay off our car. But the thing when it comes to love is you never pay it off. You always owe it. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And when we realize that and when we can begin to embrace that, I think society would be a whole lot better when we realize that we owe it. We, we, <laughs> the only debt we are to carry is the debt to love one another. It's the only debt that, 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 that we ought to carry. It's the only debt that we ought to embrace and understanding exactly what love means. Because oftentimes we can love the way the world loves and the, you know, that's the butterflies in my stomach. I can't sleep, can't live without you. I'm going to cut your tires up if you leave me. <laughs> like that's foolishness. But love is like it makes me do right by you even when I feel like doing wrong. Even when I feel like I want to harm you because you've done some bad things to me, love makes me do right by you even when I want to do wrong. And, and, and so we define love the way the Bible defines love. And how Paul, Paul defines love, he says love is patient. He says love is kind. He says it's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. He says it does not dishonor others. Why is it such a difficult concept for the followers of Christ to embody? Some of the most meanest people I ever met in my life was in the church. Some of the most fighting people I've ever met was in the church. Some of the most abusive people I ever met was in the church. Now, I'm not saying this to rail on the church. I'm saying this, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to do better. I'm saying this to the, the, with the hope that we inspire one another to go above and beyond what we've seen, to go above and beyond what we've experienced. The problem that I see in our society when we look at the headlines and we read the headlines and we watch the news, the problem I see is there is a lack of love for our neighbor. The world is not going to teach us how to love a neighbor. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we are the light of the world means that we teach the world what it means to love a neighbor. Love, it's a permanent obligation. Again, it's a debt that cannot be completely paid off. We'll always be in debt to love. And let me just say, when we start talking about uh, uh, when we start talking about love, I mean, when we, last week was a tough one, we were talking about subjection to the governing authorities. And again, Paul wasn't talking about a completely different concept. Submission to the governing authorities was an outflow of our love for neighbor. What Paul has been talking about for the last couple of chapters is, is love. Let it be genuine. Let us reflect it. Let us walk in it the way Jesus walked in it. That in the midst of us being enemies to the cross, that he would come off of his throne and he would come to the earth and be willing to suffer a torturous death for people who weren't thinking about him. Who people who weren't thinking about serving him. For people who weren't thinking about worshiping him. And yet, because he loved us so, and I just love John 3 and 16, because it says for God that he so loved the world that, that he gave. And it tells us something that, that love is giving, that, that he gave something that was very special to him. That he gave something that so whoever would make the decision to be a part of his family would have the opportunity to be able to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the reason why we owe love. We can't pay Jesus back for what he did for us. Like, we deserve to be on the cross. We deserve to have the nails drilled through our hand. We deserve to have the stakes drilled through our feet. We deserve to have been mocked. We deserve to have been spit upon. We deserve to have had the crown of thorns on our head, but he stood in our place because he loved us. And, and what it, what's being asked for in return is simply is to love his creation. He said, because I loved you, now will you go and take that mercy and that grace that I've given you, that, that love, that unconditional love that I've given you, would you take it and would you give it, not just to your friend, not just to your family, not just to people who, who roll with the light you roll, and he's like, I, I, I want you to give it to, give it to your enemy. And this ties back into when Jesus said, like, man, I want you to bless those that's persecuting you. Like, now, and you know, we'd be saying a prayer like, God, make them my footstool, God. Make my enemy my footstool. You say you make them my footstool. Destroy them, God. Get rid of them. Blow them up. But, 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 but the point is, how many of us are praying for, like, like God, uh, bring truth to my enemy, God? God, help, help my enemy, God, become to, to know you in ways that I've come to know you, God. Like, when we begin to start changing the paradigm, I think the paradigm in our society will begin to change. We've got to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that we are the church and we set the temperature for the society that we live in. And we're letting too many things, too many talking heads decide what it is that we care about, what it is that we represent. And, and look at this, the second part of verse 8 says, for the one who loves has fulfilled the law. I want you to understand, this is something, this is, this is some major stuff here because we're talking about 613 Old Testament uh, uh, laws. 613. How many of us can fulfill all of that? But he says, the one who loves fulfills the entire law. This is, this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, and, and so, so how is the law, is, how, how is it fulfilled? And, and, and Well, Paul, he sums it up in verse 9. Look at what he says in, in verse 9. He says, he, he says, for the commandments, you should not commit adultery. He said, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you should not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so start thinking about all of the things that he says that we shall not do. It sounds like works, right? But let me just tell you that love is not works, love is a posture. 
It may sound like works, may sound like works, but because I love, as a, 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 as, as a reflection of the love that I have, I just absolutely don't do those things. And so I'm not working just not to do those things, but, but love is a reflection that says those things don't exist in my life. He says all of these things can be just simply summed up because we're not going to do wrong by our neighbor. Our posture of love is the real measure of our obedience to God. Understanding that, uh, that, that love is, is, abs- is an absolute posture. And Paul says in verse 10, he said that love does no wrong to a neighbor. And he goes on to say, therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. It fulfills the law. Now, now remember talking about love at some point. And I remember a pastor saying, y'all keep talking about all this love stuff. Y'all are going to quit talking about all this love stuff. And y'all better start living holy. <laughs> and I, I just could not connect the dots. I just, not, could, could, just couldn't connect the dots because if you asked me to sum up the Bible in one word, it would simply be love. I know people like rules, and they want to hold people accountable, and they want people to get judgment and all that other stuff. Like, like all of that stuff it can, can exist, but I'm just uh, simply saying that if we summed it up in one word, it's love. Matter of fact, Paul is summing it up in one word. He says all the law is fulfilled in one thing, and he's not saying something that Jesus didn't say. Jesus said it himself. In Matthew 22, Jesus, they asked him, like, Jesus, what is the greatest command? What is the greatest command? They asked him, what is the greatest command? And what did Jesus say? He says to love God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. And he says the second is like it. I want you to understand. He said to love your neighbor as yourself. How is the second like it? Because when you love your neighbor, you love God. When you love your persecutor, you love God. When you love the one that owes you money and won't pay you back, you love God. When you love the one that cheated on you, you love God. Like, I I, I hope I'm stirring up some emotions because every sin that's happened against you, at some point in our life, we've been guilty of some of the same sins against, against God. And the only thing that we have to give, because, you know, I, I, I come from a, a church background where we had, to, we had to work. We had to get it right. We did have to live holy. Like, we, we had to get it right. And every time you messed up, you have to come back to the altar and get saved again. And when I found out, like, all the things that I could not get right on my own, when I, find out, when I found out that I could get it all right, by just perfecting one thing, by just perfecting one thing, I, 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 man, I, I, I was excited to understand that like all I got to do is to love the way, way God has required me to love and I fulfill everything. Man, when I understood that, it took me to a whole other place because I lived all of my life on the outside thinking that I was doomed for hell because I could not get it right. Love is the fulfillment of the law. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a Christian obligation to to embody what it means to love a neighbor. The second point we find is that we have a Christian obligation to eradicate works of darkness. Let's pick up in verse 11. Look at what it says. It says, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believe. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. If you're following along in verse 12, I want to bring to your attention, let us cast off the works of darkness. Uh, Again, may the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. Uh, uh, Here, Paul, he builds on this concept of love as a posture, fulfilling the law. By beginning the first part of verse 11, saying, besides this, you know the time. The hour has come for you to wake from sleep. In other words, it's as if he's saying, you know what time it is. <laughs> like, 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 yeah. 
and, and, and as Paul is addressing some of the Christians in, in Rome, you know, they had this mindset that like, man, that, that Jesus could come back at any given time. And they thought, they really believed, many of them believed that, that Jesus would return during their lifetime. Ladies and gentlemen, and I mean, the, the point is, we don't know when he might return, but, you know, the thing is, is Paul is saying, y'all, we, we need to be ready. <laughs> uh, Paul is saying, that let, let's live our life as, as though we're ready. And so he's saying, like, you, you know what time it is. And, and, and so he calls out the, the Christians in Rome to walk in a manner that reflects that they are in the bottom of the ninth. Ladies and gentlemen, like, we're in the bottom of the ninth, and one thing about it, you know, is as long as you keep living, you keep realizing that you, we're not getting any younger. We ain't, time, time is, time is running, time is running, and while we're here, how will we make an impact in the lives of others? How will we make an impact in the spaces and places that we occupy? And, 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 and so, and, and here it is, so Paul, he's instructing the Roman Christians to live their lives on purpose. Because time is limited. And I have to ask that question to each and every one of us in here. How many of us are living our lives on purpose? How many of us is just letting life happen to us? And, and versus how many of us are living our lives on purpose? Every, every time that I wake up in the morning, I, you know, I haven't always been here, so don't let, let, me, let me say that as well. But, but, but I'm at, at a point right now, I've had enough loss in my life. I've had enough suffering in my life. I had enough failure in my life to one day I just woke up and just decided, like, you know, screw Kurt's way. This is where Kurt's way has gotten me. When I wake up in the morning, my, I wake up in the morning, how can my life bring God glory? Only have so much time, I don't know how long I'll be here. You don't know how long you'll be here. How will you live your life? How will your life positively impact the lives of somebody else? We're not just talking about it. We're not just saying it's too bad, this happened and that happened. How are we impacting the spaces and the places that we occupy? We live our lives on purpose. It's no longer about, uh, you know, I used to live a life where I just wanted to be happy. Just wanted to be happy. One thing I learned about happiness is happiness is oftentimes preceded by uh, sadness. Be happy one moment, sad the next moment, depending on your earthly circumstance. So one day I, I got the opportunity to learn something about joy. Because no matter what my earthly circumstance is, like I understand that there's something about joy. My joy comes from the Lord, from my place in the Lord. My joy comes from walking in obedience with God. My joy comes from being in partnership with my Lord, being in obedience with my Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, when we can get to this place that, like, God, you can use me for your glory. Like, use me the way that you desire to use me. My life is no longer my own because you paid for me. You paid for me, God, and because you paid for me, my life is yours. Do with it what you will. So Paul, he's instructing the Roman Christians. He's like, we don't know how much time we got. But he says the time is near. He says salvation is nearer to us today than it was before. He's like the time is now. And in fact, he says that the hour has come for you to wake from your sleep. Meaning cruise control Christianity. You know, we give our lives to the Lord and we're happy that we're going to go to heaven and, and then we just, we just want to sit and revel in the blessings of the Lord. Cruise crows, cruise control Christianity. And, 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 but what Paul is saying, he's like, no, I, I really want you to, 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 to live your life on purpose. I, I want you to take it off cruise control. What happens when you're on cruise control and you're on a road trip? You put it on cruise control and you just stand, and next thing you know, you start getting sleepy. And the danger of cruise control is crashing. And many of us have have faced an accident or a crash in our walk in Christianity because we put it on cruise control. And I'm telling you, we can't put it on cruise control because if we put it on cruise control, what's going to happen, we're going to operate out of our natural man because that's what we know. That's what we know best. 
We didn't wake up in the morning. I mean, we, 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 we wasn't born with Christ, not the first time. So when we put it on cruise control, so, so, so here, here it is. Paul, he, he, he understands the propensity of Christians sleepwalking with God instead of a conscious walk with God. So it's, it's a beautiful thing that we receive salvation and, and we receive him as our Savior. But, but let me tell you something. In order to have him as our Lord, we have to consciously walk with him as our Lord. We, we've got to consciously walk with him. And, 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 and we can do a bunch of religious things and still be sleep towards God. Like, I read my Bible. Check. Went to church this week. Check. I served. Check. Yeah, you know, did some evangelism. Check. Like, we can check a bunch of things off of our, our, our list and we can still be asleep in our relationship with God. So, so Paul, he wants the Christians in Rome to awake from cruise control Christianity because salvation was near. In, in, in fact, the second part of verse 11, he says, salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. And let me just say, it was true then, still true today. Still, still true today. And, and, and though the Christians of that era believed the end of the ages was upon them, again, the statement is all the more relevant today. And let me just say, the one thing that we don't get back, ladies and gentlemen, is time. So I think back, I'm forever haunted by watching my friend get beat up. Forever haunted by that. I mean, me and some of my friends, we, we still talk about it to this day. I'm, I, I, I mean, it's a regret that I just continue to live with. I mean, we could all just got beat up. But one thing that you don't get back is time. And so while the time that we have here, how will we allow Jesus to use us with the time that we have here? As each day goes by, we get closer and closer to the end of our lives. In verse 12, he continues to speak uh, to this eclipse of time by saying, he says, the night is gone. He says, the day is at hand. And in other words, what he's saying is tomorrow is not promised. And as a result of living in that knowledge in the second part of verse 12, he says, So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. So, so Paul is saying, it's like, cast, cast it off. He's, he's like, cast it off. And this, this is interesting because uh, in Galatians 5 and 19, Paul, he speaks on the works of the flesh. In and, 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 and Galatians 5 and 19, he says, now the works of the flesh are evident. He says, sexual immorality, impurity, in, in, uh, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness. Orgies and things like these, as, as, as Paul would say. And what Paul is saying, he says, let us cast off those things of darkness. And, 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 and he says, and put on these, this armor of light. And, 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 and the interesting thing is here is he, he's not divorcing what he's saying from his call to love a neighbor. And love is the fulfilling of the law. How do I cast off the works of darkness? By walking in love. See, we can focus on, like, how do I do it? How do I pull it off? How do I do it? I got to not do this, and I got to not do that, and not do that. And, and essentially, it's not about what, you don't, what you're not supposed to do, but it's essentially just simply walking in love. It fulfills the entire law. And so he says, cast off these, this, this works of darkness and put on this armor of light. And, and the last thing that he says, not only... Uh, do we have this Christian obligation to, to, to eliminate these works of darkness? But the, but the third and final point that we see in this passage is this Christian obligation to emphasize the putting on of Jesus. Look at what it says in verse 13. It says, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Again, may the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. What we find, uh, if you're following along, I want, to bring, I want you to highlight, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, here we see that Paul sounds quite similar to the Paul that we heard 
again in, 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 in Galatians 5 and 19. Uh, some of the same things that he describes as the works of the flesh, he describes here. And after encouraging his audience to cast off the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light, he speaks, he speaks to the believer in the way a believer should walk. Uh, but let me say this. To cast off and to put on, it lends itself to this concept of turning away from and turning to. In other words, repentance. In, in order to cast off, it's, it's turning away from. I turn away from one thing and I, and I turn to. You. It, it, isn't it interesting that you can't do both at the same time? I turn away from and I turn to. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what repentance looked like. Some, you know, some people think repentance means saying I'm sorry. Like anybody could be sorry. Like uh, there's a lot of uh, murderers behind bars that are sorry. Um, but repentance means like, man, it means that like I don't continue in this. Like I, I don't just keep continuing to go after it and saying, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, and, and, and beautiful thing, he's, he's just and he's faithful to forgive you, but ladies and gentlemen, that's not repentance. Repentance means that, that I cast it off, which means that I turn away from and I turn to. And I begin to start walking closer to him, getting closer and closer to him, getting closer and closer to him. Like my, my desire is that I, I, I want to be pleasing to him. My desire is that I want to know him in ways that I've never known him. My desire is that I want to experience him in ways that I've never experienced him. I, I, I can assure you if we fill our time up with getting to know him, we're getting to experience him in ways that we never have, you'd be surprised what we're able to cast off. And Paul says, put on Jesus. This is what it takes to put on Jesus. And again, he begins 13 saying, let us walk properly in the daytime and not in the orgies and drunkenness and sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Essentially, Paul speaks on what to do as much as he does on what not to do, on what not to do, which again lends itself to repentance. Paul uses some very clear examples of what walking properly in the daytime does not look like. He, he's not leaving anything for the imagination. In other words, he, he speaks to the Christian obligation to be a reflection of light and not a reflection of our flesh. There's, there's, ladies and gentlemen, there's a, there's a huge difference to be a reflection of Jesus versus being a reflection of our flesh. It's, 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 it's this constant battle. The big question we might ask is, how do we become a, a reflection of light? How do we become a re reflection of Jesus? And, and let me first tackle that question by saying we are not obligated to do. We could do a bunch of stuff, but it won't get us very far. So we're not obligated to do. We're obligated to be. There's a difference between doing and being. A huge, huge difference. And, and let me just say, when who we are changes, when we allow God to change us, when who we are changes, what we do will also change. And, and, and subsequently, Paul, he answers the question of how it is that we become a reflection of light. In verse 14, he says, I put on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he says. He says, and make no provision for the flesh. And let me just say this, our flesh will be as active in our lives as we allow it to be. Just as Jesus will be as active in our lives as we allow it to be. Ladies and gentlemen, so, so we do got a choice in the matter. We could be a reflection of our flesh or we could be a reflection of Jesus. And, and, and I say because he made the decision to come off his throne and to suffer a grueling death for not just my sins, but for all of our sins that's in here. Matter of fact, for the sins of the world because he stood in our place and he took the pain and he took all of the things that we should have received because of that. Ladies and gentlemen, like I love him and I love his creation. 
even if they happen to be on the other side of the aisle. So my challenge for you as you leave this place, if you have not received him as your Lord and your Savior, like now's the time to take that step. The beautiful thing is he didn't just die for Christians. <laughs> In fact, he died for the world. He died for people who couldn't seem to get it right. And so while it's an easier step to accept him as our Savior, I'm going to even talk to some believers and say, how many of us believers will accept him as our Lord? Will you, uh, and so my challenge to you is will you leave this place and you allow him to be your Lord? When our flesh wants to rile up, because Paul says, make no provision for your flesh. Make no provision for it. And you say, how do I put on the light of Jesus by making no provision for that flesh? And so, so as we leave this place, we say, God, use me as you will. God, use me as you will. God, I submit myself to your lordship. Let us pray. God, you are good. We love you. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for your love, for your kindness. God, I pray right now, God, for those that may not know you, God, that they would have an opportunity to receive you, God. You said in your word, in Romans 10 and 9, that if we confess that Jesus is Lord with our mouth. And we believe in our heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. You say we shall be saved. God, I ask right now, God, for those who don't know you, that salvation will be made known to them. And God, I pray for God, our believers that's in the house today, God, that has not yet understood what it means to have you as Lord of our lives, God, that you would just come in and that you would have your way. God, we love you and we thank you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.